Starwood Equine is a full-service equine ambulatory practice with locations in Woodside, California and in the East Bay. We pride ourselves in providing comprehensive veterinary care and health management services for your equine partner and athlete. Thank you for accessing our online educational resources. Check back often as we will continue to update the site. Tonight we're going to be talking about lameness exams and um, different causes of lameness, giving you hopefully just a, a broad overview of potential causes um, and hopefully not creating any more angst or worry for you, but rather giving you a couple of um, good takeaways that you can keep in mind um, while you are um, working with your horses. So thanks again for joining us. And I am going to turn it over to Dr. Wright for the first bit. Okay, hi everybody, thanks for joining. Um, first, we're just gonna go over some of the parts of a lameness evaluation. Um, every case is different you know, sometimes it's very obvious, like, you know, the horse has pus coming out of its foot or something, or, um, you know, there's a big swollen tendon or something like that. So, um, you know, we don't always do every single step of a lameness evaluation, but essentially they all do start the same, which is with what we call a static exam, where we take a look at the horse, how it's standing at its confirmation. Um, we also, palpate everything, you know, joints, soft tissues, we move, move things in the range of motion to see what's normal. And we'll usually throw hoof testers on, which are those sort of medieval looking giant clampy things that we use to try and put pressure on certain parts of the foot. Um, so we, you know, we'll palpate necks and backs and all sorts of things just to try and get information. And I should say also like the history, you know, what does the horse do? What's his workload been? you know, is he coming back to work? Is he, you know, all those things are also really, really important. So when we start asking you a bunch of questions that might be boring, um, there's a reason. Um, so after we feel lots of things, we'll watch the horse go. You know, sometimes it'll be something that we can see right away in a straight line. Sometimes we need to put the horse under a couple of different circumstances to really appreciate when the lameness is, is better or worse. So we'll do um, lunging on a hard ground, on soft ground. Sometimes we have to see the horse under saddle. Sometimes when we're under saddle, we can't see it unless you sit the trot. Or sometimes we only see it, you know, for two strides after going up to the canter or something. So there can be, um, sometimes it can be obvious and sometimes it can be a little bit of detective work to really decide what's going on. Um, another thing that we'll often do, depending on the situation, are what we call flexion tests which is where we, um, we pick up a joint and we strain it and we hold it and then ask the horse to trot off. So it's, it's a rudimentary test to sort of put pressure in an area and see how they feel uh, once they start moving. Um, another thing that we will often do is, um, we call them nerve blocks, but it's diagnostic analgesia, which is just like when you go to the dentist and they block your tooth, it's the same medication and we use it strategically at different points on the leg to try and numb different parts and see if we can make the lameness go away. Um, following diagnostic analgesia and our exam, once we figure out where we're looking at, depending on how much more information we need, we'll go into imaging. Excuse me, so there's tons of different things we can do, but we usually start, the easy things to do on the farm are radiographs or ultrasounds. And then um, there are certain things, problems in the hoof capsule down low in the navicular that sometimes we do recommend advanced imaging. Um, but you know, obviously every single case is really different. Um, and then the last thing that we will do obviously is try and decide on a treatment to try and solve the problem. Sometimes we will use treatments as a diagnostic. So if we don't necessarily have a super great answer or something's not super obvious, we might say, you know what, this horse looks a lot like a horse with SI pain secondary to his hocks and he has a history of needing his hocks injected. Let's do that and see if it solves the problem. So lots of combinations of things um, to try and get the answers we need. So that's sort of a brief overview. If you have questions about any of that, we can answer them at the end. That's a picture of Dr. Moding palpating some tendons, happily. There's Sue, the happiest jogger ever. Okay, so um, the first condition that I'm gonna talk about tonight um, is a condition called laminitis. 
it, sometimes people will call it founder as well. When basically laminitis, um, it's one of those things that horse owners usually get very scared about because um, it is pretty complicated and it can be pretty devastating if it's not caught and treated appropriately. But eventually, uh, essentially what it is, is it is defined as the disruption of the blood flow to the lamina, which are the little tiny blood vessels that hold the, the hoof, the, um, the coffin bone inside the hoof. So if you look at this um, radiograph, the coffin bone in this picture is supposed to be a nice little triangle, but at the bottom, it's the bottom bone is kind of disheveled looking, and that is from chronic, chronic laminitis and disruption to that hoof. Um, so like this, we don't see this, this is bad news. Um, so this is what we are looking at when we're talking about the lamina. So the coffin bone is the triangle shaped bone at the bottom with the red pointer. Um, and then the lamina is the pink layer in between the gray hoof wall and the white coffin bone. And again, those are basically little tiny feathery blood vessels that hold together. And if those get disrupted or inflamed or scarred, the tendon, the deep digital flexor tendon, which is in the back of the leg, um, it's that pink stripey thing that comes down, it attaches on the other side of the coffin bone. And those are in a delicate balance to keep that coffin bone where it needs to be. So if you get inflammation that is bad enough in the front of the foot on the lamina, the um, tension from that deep digital flexor tendon can pull and rotate the location of the coffin bone in the foot. Um, and so what that does for us is basically, um, it does give us a way to use radiographs to monitor damage and change in the foot and also enables us to be able to help the horse with mechanics and biomechanics later on down the road. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Does any of you have any questions about that anatomy before we move on? Okay, cool. So we'll talk about causes of laminitis. Um, there are lots of them, but most of them are things that we can um, prevent and deal with. So one of the most common causes are excess carbohydrates. So that goes anything like the pony gets out and eats all the grain in the grain room, or it's the lush green springtime grass and the horses are out and the grass is really green and it hasn't been. Um, or anytime there's an abrupt change in feeding or routines, like if you change your grain and don't um, mix them for a few days and give the horses a chance to adjust, that can cause laminitis. Another big category of causes is what we call metabolic disease. So I know last week some of you were here when we talked about equine metabolic syndrome and insulin dysregulation, as well as Cushing's or PPID. Those are both conditions that make horses more prone to laminitis. Um, as far as sicknesses and things that cause it concurrently, any sort of endotoxemia or overload of toxins can make a horse prone to laminitis. So colitis or like a very severe diarrhea where the bowel wall is compromised, retained placenta in mares that have just given birth, and then um, a disease called Potomac horse fever, which um, from the name Potomac River, far away, lives near water, not here, we don't have to worry about it, but um, that disease can cause laminitis. Um, one of the other most common reasons that we see it is a condition called support limb laminitis, which is where a horse has a devastating injury or a very chronic injury on the other foot and then they are not bearing their weight evenly and they overload the healthy foot. Um, a case of that is the horse down at the bottom, that's Barbaro, the racehorse that broke his ankle in the Preakness um, and they ended up fixing it with like, I mean, amazing surgery and he ended up succumbing to laminitis several months um, down the road just because his discomfort and inability to be evenly balanced. Um, black walnut shavings, I don't think I mean, have you guys ever seen that? I mean, that's like a thing that doesn't really happen anymore, but don't plant walnut trees in your horse pasture. Um, and then excessive concussive horses. I, I think that, I mean, I haven't been in California very long, but when I was in Idaho, the ground was really hard and I would see a fair bit of that. And I'm assuming here in the dry season, horses out on trails, hard ground, that can really cause some damage. So, you know, that's preventable with appropriate shoeing and boots and that kind of thing. So moving on, some of the risk factors, and these all kind of go with some of the causes. There are certain breeds of horses that are more likely to be laminitic, but these are also the breeds of horses that are more likely to have equine metabolic syndrome and some insulin regulation problems. So 
giraffes, ponies, minis, morgans, donkeys, you know the horses that are like air plants where they just like look at some food and they start getting fat? Those horses um, are the ones that are going to be more apt um, to get laminitis. And then again, endocrine disease, Cushing's, and then like we already said, carbohydrate-rich diet and springtime grass. And then um, unfortunately, a horse that has had an episode of laminitis where those lamina have been weakened are going to be at a slightly increased risk of that in the future. Okay, sorry, I drank a whole Coke on my way home today, so I feel like I'm like shaking. <laughs> um, it's carbohydrate it's overload. It's, yeah, it is hot in the East Bay, you guys. I was sweating today. <laughs> Um, okay, so clinical signs, you know, how are you going to know if your horse might be having a laminitic episode? So the common things that we see, and obviously other veterinarians, um, please chime in for anything else you've seen, but um, we'll typically see horses that are just uncomfortable and they're sort of shifting their weight. They will also stand, hopefully not as extreme as this guy in the picture, but they'll be standing back in what we call the sawhorse stance, trying to get pressure off the front of their feet and onto their heels. And they can also just be like very hesitant and just like walking on eggshells and really kind of tippy toey. Um, digital pulses, which we talked about in our first um, horsey hour where you feel their heartbeat um, on the side of their fetlocks will often be increased. You can sometimes feel heat in their hooves. And then for us, you know, we'll throw hoof testers on them and we will feel um, we will feel them be very uncomfortable in that area. Um, so then of course, like I said, we'll ask you a bunch of very annoying questions, but those will usually help us determine if this is something that is happening and why. Um, sometimes we will do what's called a venogram. Um, I haven't actually done one of those in a long time because I think we're getting better and better at, um, radiographs and therapy right away, but essentially we can look at, for horses that have chronic damage, we can do a contrast study and look at how the blood vessels are going in the foot and see if there's kind of like a dead zone or something like that. But the most common thing we will do for diagnosis is take radiographs um, so that we know how to shoe the horse to be most comfortable. <sighs> okay, so let's say we come out and we decide that your horse is having an episode of laminitis because they got into the grain room and ate half a bag of sweet feed. So actually that's a different problem. We would treat that with a tube and some charcoal maybe, but the feet thing, what we would do, the first thing we want to do with laminitis is pain relief. We want the horse to feel better. Um, obviously we're going to remove the inciting factor if that's possible. Um, there's a lot of research about icing the horse's foot and distal limb and essentially and other doctors, especially Kirsty, who reads every journal article all the time, correct me if I'm a couple months late, but essentially icing can be really good when it first happens, but you have to make sure the whole limb is iced is at that temperature all the time. Like it's not quite as helpful to like put some, put a horse in ice for 20 minutes and then leave it for the rest of the day. Um, you're not necessarily getting the huge benefit of the icing if that's the case. Um, supportive bedding, boots, pads. We want to do anything we can so that that horse's foot has lots of support all around it. Um, so a lot of times deep shavings are good. Sand, horses standing in sand can be really, really comfortable because that will really fill every crevice and give that foot a lot of support. And then obviously we want to treat any concurrent diseases. So if we decide that like, okay, maybe this is the horse telling us he can't be out on green grass. Maybe we're going to test for some insulin glucose, that kind of thing, and see if the horse is regulating his insulin okay and deal with his diet. Um, so that's sort of the acute stage. And then once we get the horse comfortable and have sort of figured out how we're going to attack this problem, the, we get into the management stage, which um, essentially is three-pronged approach. Number one is going to be therapeutic shoeing. So we will take x-rays um, of the horse's foot so that we can see where that coffin bone is. And, you know, ideally we don't see any changes when it first happens. Um, and then we can say, great, let's shoe this horse in a way to support that foot and ensure that we don't get any changes. Um, and then for a horse that's had many episodes, we can change biomechanically how things are going to take less pressure off the front of the foot and really get that horse comfortable. Dietary management is going to be the key for most of the horses. I mean, I would say, I mean, 
Kelly, Christy, Kelly, tell me if you think this is wrong, but I think in, in this area, the most common cause of laminitis is going to be um, easy keepers getting too many carbohydrates. So talking about dietary management, increasing fat, decreasing carbohydrates is always a good thing. Um, and then medical management, if the horse does happen to have concurrent PPID or Cushing's, that is something that is easily treatable to help this horse manage the situation. I would, yeah, I would add that the, um, the last thing and that came up at, in the meeting last week when we were talking about equine metabolic syndrome and Cushing's is um, that because a lot of horses around here don't have access to the fresh grass, we're not necessarily seeing that spike in the spring when um, the horses are all being turned out on these lush, thick pastures. Um, but we can, if, if your horse is in that particular situation, the other time that I tend to feel like is the witching hour or the witching month is October when day length is shortening. Um, we tend to have horses that have sort of uncontrolled Cushing's disease, uh, have laminitic flare ups and we see them for this acute laminitic episode. And then that kind of triggers us to start testing. Um, and then we discover that those horses actually have um, Cushing's disease and, and probably have this flare up because of the decreasing day length. So that I would add that as like a California thing for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. This is a picture of a horse. When we take radiographs, we have them stand up on blocks and that way we can image the whole foot, including the sole. Cause one of the things that we measure, not only do we measure where the coffin bone is sitting, but we always want to know how much sole is underneath that coffin bone. So we know how much foot there is to work with. Um, and then this, I started drawing some lines on it. Um, so these are two different horses. These are lateral views. So looking from the outside to the inside of the foot, and you can see in the first picture on the left, the triangle shaped coffin bone is parallel to the hoof wall. Um, so it's in pretty good shape. I mean, obviously we can always nitpick at things, but that is what we are looking at is that the front of the coffin bone is lined up with the hoof wall. If you move over to the picture on the right, you can see that the angle of that coffin bone is not the same as the angle of the hoof wall. Um, and so that is, very basically one of the things we are looking at. And you can kind of imagine that tendon that we talked about attaching at the bottom of the coffin bone. So you can see how that bone gets pulled by the tendon once there's nothing holding it appropriately at the front of the foot. Um, so what we would do is take that radiograph, talk to the farrier, change some things, and then be happy because the horse will feel better. Um, so that is my bit on laminitis, so happy to answer any questions about it at the end of the session. Thanks, Cara. This is Christy here, guys. Um, and I just want to add, you know, I had to deal with a lot of laminitis practicing on the East Coast with excessive lush pastures. And um, it's not something that we all need to live in fear of. Um, there's a lot of studies that say, you know, if, if your horse doesn't have an underlying problem like metabolic or Cushing's that um, you are very unlikely to have an issue. Even if they do say get out on lush pasture for a few hours, it's probably going to be okay. You guys, can you hear me okay? Yep. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right, so we're gonna go through um, a little bit more now about another topic. Um, we're gonna go through a common thing that we see a lot of abscesses. And uh, for my own personal horse, I would occasionally go out to see him and find him to be non-weight bearing lame on one of his legs. And ironically, I was actually happy. Um, I would say about 95% of the time when we get that severe of lameness, we're looking at a hoof abscess rather than something more serious. Uh, so sounds kind of funny, but um, it's true. So um, just to kind of give you guys an idea of your approach on the farm and some things you might be looking for, um, whenever you go out and find your horse, we like to say um, three-legged lame, <laughs> fed 
clients be like, no, it's just the one leg. I'm like, no, I know it <laughs> uh, just means that basically they don't want to bear weed at all. Um, the first thing you want to do is pick up that hoof and, and see, is there a nail in it? Is there something that they've stepped on? And if so, if possible, call your vet before removing that um, and, and be able to send a picture. The nice thing about technology is we, we can get a, an idea of what's going on really quickly with that. Um, the next thing that we'd like for you to do is just kind of palpate the entire leg and make sure that all the bones feel okay, there's not any swelling in certain areas, you know, all the way up through the shoulder, um, you want to palpate for any sort of swelling, crunching, that kind of thing, any sort of reaction. Uh, the other thing that we want you to do is actually poke all the way around on um, the coronary band. So. Uh, occasionally with a hoof abscess, you actually find it's already draining some pus in one of the sites or one of the areas around the coronary band feels really swollen and painful. So it's about to come out at the coronary band. Um, so that's actually a place that's really good to check. And um, at the heel bulbs as well, that can be a site that is really painful and is a good one to check. Another thing we'd like you guys to be checking is uh, the digital pulses. So uh, this horse has a little marker line drawn of where the artery is that you're feeling along there. Um, and there's actually one on the inside of the leg and the outside. So usually we're pacing our um, pointer finger and our thumb right on where that would be. And then we just kind of wait. We gotta remember their heart rate's normally pretty low. Um, when they're in that much pain, it could be higher. So normal's around 40. Sometimes if they're just standing there with a painful abscess, it can be 60, even up to 80. Um, but it's slower than you'd think for your own heart rate. So you just kind of need to feel around there and wait to feel something. Um, this is actually something that I think is, for those of you that have access to your horse right now, a really great thing to practice doing when they're not having an issue. Because to me, we can almost barely feel, um, almost barely feel anything. Uh, when when it's normal and then it feels almost booming when they're having an issue um, It's also super useful to feel you know the lame leg versus the normal leg to give you an idea if you're like Is that an increased pulse? Does it feel like more pressure than the other side? Um, so you can almost put a, a hand on each side and feel them at the same time So that's marker gives you a good idea of of what you're what you're looking for um, So those are your initial things um, the next thing to do is um, potentially have one of us out. Now, if there happens to be a farrier at the barn, they generally will have hoof testers as well. Um, so we're happy to have a farrier hoof test um, in advance. But for the most part, I think it's a good idea to at least give us a call. If you've got something like this going on, especially if we're not certain it's an abscess, um, some of the other things that can cause that degree of lameness would be a fracture. So it's obviously quite important that we know which of those two things it is. Um, so when we come out, we'll check their heart rate, we'll check their temperature. Occasionally horses with an abscess will have a very mild temperature elevation, sometimes not, but I'll find like, you know, 101.8, which is just above normal, but um, on a cool day, I would say, yeah, that's a little more suspicious. Um, and we'll feel the digital pulses as well. We'll palpate the leg and then we'll hoof test. Now, one thing Thing that's a little bit upsetting is that not every horse with a hoof abscess will be painful to hoof testers. Um, so the pain is from pus being stuck in a pocket with a tissue that doesn't have a lot of give. So you think this is kind of gross a little before dinner, but um, even if you have a pimple that's very full, that pressure is really painful. So you can imagine hoof tissue that's even less pliable than skin is really painful. But if the pus happens to be a location that's deeper in the hoof or more diffuse, they may not react. Also, we get occasional horses that are just really good citizens and just don't react because they think the hoof test is what we want them to be doing. So we will uh, occasionally get those. Um, in terms of treatment, what we'll do, now we may sometimes block out the hoof if we're not 100% sure that that's where the pain's coming from. Car talked a bit about that. Um, the main treatment is to get that pus drained out of there. So antibiotics aren't terribly effective unless we feel like the bacteria are getting up into the tissues uh, above the hoof. Um, and so really just getting that pressure release gets them more comfortable. Um, also, that's a bit of an unfair fact about hoof abscesses is even if I get profuse drainage, just pus coming out, 
I always want them to be instantly comfortable because I found the abscess and drained it. But it generally takes about 24 hours even after drainage to be comfortable. So don't be upset if right after drainage they're not comfortable. Um, to encourage that drainage, we'll all often soak the hoof in uh, water with some Epsom salts or water with some betadine. There's also this picture is of animal intex pads, which are these pads that you can soak and they soften up the hoof wall and they also draw the pus out by osmotic pressure and they have a little disinfectant in them. So I love these pads. I do think that they help abscesses clear sooner and best of all, they're actually cheap. Um, so that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, in terms of applying the shoe, that's a more complicated question um, than, than you'd think because some abscesses will close up too soon and then continue to produce pus. So I like them to be sound for at least 24 hours, um, but it's gonna be a case by case basis. Like if you have a show and they're sound, we may need to push the shoe a little bit sooner um, than not. Uh, the next thing I just wanna mention, cause I do, Clara mentioned this, I love reading my journals and I love studies and not much has been done, ironically, on hoof abscesses when it's one of the most common things that we treat. So there was a big study out of uh, Pennsylvania um, that studied this. And some of the facts that they found that I just wanted to share with you is that they're more common in front limbs. That makes sense. There's more weight on the front limb. Um, it also may be that it's more obvious when it's a front limb lameness. A horse should never be resting a front limb. That's a huge red flag. If people say, well, he's just resting it. Mm, horses rest back legs, they don't rest front legs, unless there's a huge problem. Another thing they found is that June to November was the most common time for abscesses. We just think the bacteria are more likely to get in those little cracks of the hoof um, during warmer months, and I think that's mostly true for California as well. Um, abscesses occurring along the coronary band tend to take longer veterinary treatment than those occurring elsewhere. And that infection can get into those higher up tissues and cause a problem. Um, it also can disrupt the hoof wall as it's growing out. So my preference is always to get it drained at the bottom of the hoof, but that's not always possible. I'll take any drainage over no drainage. Um, one of the other things that they found is abscesses during the summer took 10 times longer to heal than those diagnosed during the winter. Um, so that may be because the hoofs, the hooves of these horses are drier and harder in the winter, so it's harder to get drainage, but they don't know 100% why they found that. Um, horses with abscesses in multiple locations in the same hoof were more likely to have complications, which that makes sense. Sometimes it's just one little pea-sized pus pocket and you're good, and sometimes there's pus hiding out in multiple locations. If the veterinarian found the abscess track on the first visit, healing time improved by 27%. Um, so we always are going to try to get drainage that first visit. There may be cases where we are following a, a little necrotic track and feel like, you know, the, the more I dig this, the more hoof imbalance I'm gonna create and it's actually better to soak it and let it drain on its own, but we are going to try. I think my take home from this was that the sooner you get a veterinarian to be out there to treat an abscess, the sooner it's going to be better. And now we have scientific fact to prove that. Male horses were more likely to get hoof abscesses and took significantly longer to heal than did females. Um, my takeaway is that we know in all species, females are tougher than males. Just kidding. That's, <laughs> that's not really my point. I had a gelding. I love him. Um, we don't know why that is, um, why the male horses are getting them more and taking longer to heal. Um, but I think it's interesting and I think we should look into that because it was pretty statistically significant. Um, so sorry to offend any of you with gelding. All right, and my last uh, fact from this study was that more severe lameness was actually associated with a shorter healing time. A uh, little bit surprising, but the thought is that those really severe lamenesses we're putting so much pressure because they were actually about to burst and drain. So often, uh, hoof abscess will get a little worse before it gets better because it's about to drain. Uh, so those are my fun facts from this, this recent study on hoof abscesses. Well, thank you, Christy. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about soft tissue injuries. Um, so every year, um, anywhere between 13 and 18% of horses will sustain a soft tissue injury that's um, bad enough that it causes them to be laid up for a little while. 
Um, so what is soft tissue? Soft tissue is basically any tissue in the body that's not bone. So that's muscle, cartilage, um, but the main ones that sustain injuries in horses are the tendons and the ligaments. So that's primarily what I'm gonna be sticking to in the next few slides. Um, so tendons and ligaments, they're both made of tightly bound um, collagen fibers, but they do have um, several pretty important differences. So tendons, um, they attach muscle to bone, um, and their job is to help control the movement of the leg. So they help flex and extend the leg. Um, they have a high tensile strength and they're pretty elastic, which allows them to be more shock absorbing for the leg. Ligaments, on the other hand, they connect bone to bone. So their job is actually to um, add stability to the limb. So a lot of times you'll find them on either side of a joint um, or running back behind a joint. Um, and they basically help to hold that joint in place. They are stiff, they're not very elastic, um, which allows them to be resistant to forces like shearing um, or twisting as the horse moves. Um, so soft tissue injuries, why do they happen? Um, there's a number of reasons <laughs> and they can kind of be divided into like, you know, three categories or so. So the first one, um, very important one is mechanical overload. So this happens when the individual fiber bundles in a tendon or ligament are stretched beyond their capacity, um, which causes those fibers in there to rupture. Um, this can happen either in one quick event, the horse falls, um, does a quick turn, steps in a hole out in the pasture while they're running around, um, or it can happen with repetitive overstretching, so small increments of repetitive overstretching. Um, and Cara kind of mentioned the importance of hoof angle. So sometimes when a horse's hoof angle is off, their toe is long or something like that, um, it can actually put pressure on those structures in the hoof um, and cause damage to them. Um, another category is trauma, so mostly blunt trauma. A horse gets its leg stuck in a fence, um, it gets kicked by his a pasture mate, something like that, that causes the fibers in a tendon or ligament to rupture. Um, and then the last one is um, restriction. So this can be caused by a bandage that was placed improperly. Um, a lot of times when we're learning to put bandages on, a lot of people like to tighten the bandage across the back of the tendons. Um, and that can kind of put a lot of force on those tendons and cause the fibers to rupture um, in some places. So then there's also a couple um, additional factors that can contribute to um, tendon rupture or, or ligament rupture. Um, and those include um, exercising outside of their level of conditioning. So for example, um, I think a lot of us, if we tried to go out and run a half marathon right now um, without any prior conditioning, we would not only feel sorry for ourselves for about a week, but also put ourselves um, in a lot of uh, danger for injury. We'll get fatigued quicker and um, that can predispose you to injury of soft tissue. Um, another thing is not warming up before exercise. So you pull the horse out of its stall and immediately go to jumping or a really tough trail ride or something like that. So warming up is just as important for horses as it is for us when we're gonna be doing some form of elevated exercise. Um, and then the other, there's another factor, um, age is always a factor, unfortunately, um, in some of our older guys, metabolism is slower. Um, metabolism is really slow in tendons and ligaments anyway. So you add on a little bit of age and they're not quite as capable of, um, fixing that, those little micro tears and micro damage that just happen normally, um, which can then cause tendons and ligaments to kind of weaken um, over time and put you at a little bit higher risk for um, rupture or tear. So um, your horse goes lame, um, you call your vet out and Cara mentioned a lot of this, so I won't um, dwell on it, but um, a good history is not to be underestimated. It's really important. So when your vet comes out, it's really great to have the answers to, um, you know, when did you first notice that giant swelling on your horse's leg? Um, when did you notice the heat there? 
Um, did your horse fall recently? Um, what's the previous history of lameness, whether it's in that leg that it seems to be affected now or in any other? Um, so then we'll move on to our lameness exam, which always begins with a good observation um, and palpating all the, the limbs. <clears throat> Um, so with soft tissue, we think a lot about heat and swelling and um, visible bumps and stuff like that, which can happen a lot with soft tissue injuries, but not always. So that's why it's really important to run your hands everywhere um, and observe the movement um, and then move to localizing. So we do that with nerve blocks, um, stuff like that. So we've localized the area where we think there might be an injury. Um, we think it's soft tissue. So then our mainstay in diagnosing and actually visualizing an injury is gonna be um, ultrasonography. So um, actually it helps us to look at fiber pattern, size, um, any swelling in there, stuff like that. Um, and it gives us a good baseline to follow down the road and judge severity um, and a, a bunch of other things. Um, other modes of imaging um, can include MRI, CT, um, a bone scan, stuff like that is all useful. Um, we normally don't move to those until it's the lameness is just really hard to localize um, or the area that we're trying to view is um, not visible with a typical ultrasound probe. Um, like also Dr. Wright mentioned in the, in the hoof capsule. There's a lot of soft tissue structures in there that we just can't get down and visualize with our normal ultrasound probes. Um, so here's a good example of what we would see doing an ultrasound. So um, up at the top of the screen is skin. Um, and then it moves, as you move down the screen, you're going deeper into the back of the leg, um, ending up at the bone. <clears throat> and so um, on the left hand side, you can see a nice normal structure um, of our, for example, we're highlighting the superficial digital flexor tendon. So that's nice. There's nice white fiber lines in there. There's no big black holes. Um, and the size looks decent. And then we move over to the right and look at that same structure and we see it's, it appears to be a little bit bigger. Um, there's a little black hole with a asterisk in there. Um, and so those are the things we look for, size. And then are there any suspicious looking um, areas like that black hole right there, which we would refer to as hypoechoic. So that's basically highlighting an area of the tendon that um, where there's fiber disruption. So we found um, a lesion. Um, how do we move on with treatment? So it definitely depends on location and severity um, as with anything. Um, but the main, the first thing we're gonna do is try and get ahead of that inflammation. Um, so that's going to start with rest, and that will take the form of stall rest with some hand walking. Um, you won't be returning to your uh, normal exercise routine for a little while. Um, the next thing to control information or inflammation is um, an NSAID, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Um, this can take the form of bute, um, most commonly bute, sometimes bianamine. Um, the next thing would be cryotherapy. So cold hosing legs, wrapping with ice, um, everything we can do to kind of um, constrict those blood vessels and, and bring down the inflammation. And then sometimes compression wraps, we'll use those um, to increase uh, blood flow, increase lymphatic flow, and try and get a lot of that edema or extra fluid out of there um, and keep it from stretching out tendon sheaths and skin and all of that. Um, so once we've gotten all that under control or even in the midst of getting that under control, sometimes we'll think about regenerative therapies if the lesion is a good candidate for it. So we have um, platelet-rich um, plasma, prostride, um, and basically regenerative therapies are just um, using factors, um, anti-inflammatory factors and growth factors from your horse's own blood. Um, processing them and then injecting them right back into the site of the injury to help promote healing um, and uh, get ahead of inflammation as well. Um, other therapies can look like shockwave. Um, a lot of times we'll use that for chronic injuries where the fibers have filled in but they're not quite 
um, in a good alignment. And so we can use Shockwave to kind of help encourage them to align a little bit better. Um, laser therapy is also great for these things. It helps increase blood flow and bring all those good factors that are in your horse's blood to the site of the injury um, and promote healing. Um, and then our next thing is going to be a very controlled, regimented rehabilitation and exercise program. So this isn't going to be a few weeks of you know, light riding and then you're back to it. This is going to be for soft tissue injuries, more like months to years of um, very controlled exercise, um, recheck exams to monitor what that lesion looks like. Um, is it filling in? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Um, and that kind of helps us guide through the exercise program. Um, so hopefully get to a point where your horse is back to their normal level of exercise. Um, this is a cool picture of Dr. Zaytunian. She is actually processing um, some pro stride here. So this is something we can do stall side. We bring our centrifuge, we pull the blood um, and process it and can inject it that same day, same visit um, into the lesion. And so a lot of times we'll do this, or almost all times we'll do this ultrasound guided. So we'll pop the probe back on, find where that lesion is and actually watch the screen um, and inject and see where our needle's going as it's showing there so that we can be very accurate in where we're putting that um, PRP, pressure, whatever we're injecting. Um, so minimizing risk, argu arguably the most important thing in soft tissue injury is how do we prevent it? So it kind of stems back from um, why does it happen in the first place? So a good warm up and a good cool down are very important for your horse. Um, as we talked about properly conditioning, so taking several months to build your horse up to the desired level of work rather than just going straight to the desired level of work is really important. Um, regularly scheduled hoof trims are great. Um, it helps keep the horse's hoof angles um, appropriate so that we're not putting any extra stress on any of those tendons and ligaments. Um, definitely be aware of your footing. So a lot of times we're working in deep sand. Um, be aware if you're riding over an uneven surface or if you're you know, going to be trail riding and going up steep hills, down steep hills. Um, and avoid some of those if you can. Um, and if you can't, take your time and really allow your horse to kind of see the ground and maneuver through whatever ground you're trying to get through. Um, and then also very important as you're grooming your horse, spending time with them, take the time to just run your hands over them, check for heat, check for swelling, um, be aware of if your horse is feeling a little off when you're riding, if they look a little funny trotting away from you in the pasture, um, because being able to catch these things early um, really helps in the healing process. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Matheny. Uh, so I am going to pick up um, with a discussion of arthritis. Um, there are a number of different causes of arthritis, um, and I kind of grouped it into three main categories. We can see arthritis develop because of developmental changes. Um, specifically, we're talking about OCD lesions, um, osteochondritis desiccans. Those are caused by, um, most commonly caused by foals or young horses that grow too quickly and the cartilage and bone doesn't keep up with um, the weight that they put on as they're, as they're aging and growing. Um, this fits well into our prior nutrition discussion. Um, we're really providing that balanced diet and not too many calories all at once can help pre prevent it. Um, there is some thought that there's a hereditary component as well because we do see um, these OCD lesions more uh, predominantly in the same sire, same dam um, situations. The second category would be any kind of traumatic injury. Um, so I have, uh, or I don't have, but this particular horse had a kick injury to the stifle region. Um, you can maybe appreciate this really large swelling uh, and that can lead to instability of the soft tissues that Dr. Matheny discussed. Um, and that instability um, could in turn lead to arthritis of that stifle joint. 
We also have probably the most commonly seen reason, and that's just degenerative changes. So here on the left, you know, this is the older horse that's still getting around but has these really knobby knees or carpal joints. Um, they're really inflamed. They probably don't have a lot of range, you know, range of motion where they can really bend the leg thoroughly. Um, but they're they're doing okay and they're getting around. Talking about the degenerative form a little bit more because I think that that's the one again that we we see most often and and can help I think a little bit more, um, and that is basically you know just a lifelong process. Arthritis by definition is a degenerative and progressive disease state, uh, and the reason why is if we start with this healthy joint here on the left, um, there's nice healthy thick cartilage that is a kind of a lubricating factor between the bones. Over time, if there's injury, if there's repeated wear and tear, and just with age, um, we can start to have narrowing of that cartilage, resulting in um, more chance of that bone on bone um, involvement or wear and tear. That bone on bone can then lead to more inflammatory proteins entering the joint space. The inflammatory proteins just degrade the cartilage even further, and so we kind of get this vicious cycle. Um, where we lose more cartilage because it's inflamed. Because we lose the cartilage, we create more inflammation. Um, I think you, you, you get it. Um, so what do we do about that? First thing that we do is stop the dog from my feet making all the noise, sorry. Um, and the next thing that we do is, um, you know, everybody wants, you know, we want just a simple, simple fix. And you go into any tack room, this one's actually pretty nice and clean, uh, but there's just piles and piles of different supplement options available. And um, what I'm not here today to tell you is which supplement to buy. I think it would be specific to your horse, their needs and the other products um, that you're using for them. But I do have kind of a, a nice takeaway that I want you to consider when you're looking at your supplements. And this is for joint supplements, but it's also for really any supplements that you have. Um, and before I get into it, I think now is a really great time you know, while we're not doing as much riding, maybe we have a little bit more time to spend cleaning out our tack room and looking at the supplements that we're using and um, determining, you know, do we need the supplement? Is it at the proper level and doing what it's supposed to be doing? Or maybe would, you know, these funds be better spent, um, you know, paying for hay or board or anything else uh, that, we, that we need as a priority. So, We'll follow this acclaim model. And that means finding a company whose name you recognize. So on the prior page, I had an example of Platinum Performance. Um, Platinum Performance is a well-respected company based out of um, middle of California, Southern California. Um, they have great products, they're veterinary owned. So that's, that's a name that we recognize. Other names that I'll throw out would be like a Cosequin or SmartPak um, is, is another well-known company that produces supplements. You wanna find that they have clinical experience. That means that the products that they're using have been tested and not only have they been tested, but they've been peer reviewed. So we don't wanna just see that they've hired a doctor that's on their payroll to tell you that it's going to you know, make your horse feel like a million bucks. We want to see that there's actually been um, some studies by respected journals. So um, I think you could go to our encyclopedia, Dr. Moding, who reviews all those journals and articles for us and she'd be able to kind of help you um, with that component. The next is looking at the contents of the product. And so you should very quickly and easily be able to pick out what products, what active ingredients and inactive ingredients are available in the supplement. Um, the label should be nice and clear and easy for you to pick that out or take a picture and send to us for us to pick that out. Um, you wanna look at label claims. So, you know, if they say on there that, you know, this cures joint disease, or this is, you know, gonna make your horse feel like a million bucks, as I said before, 
that's pretty lofty and, um, you know, not really a scientifically based statement. So be wary of um, heavy claims on the label. You want to notice administration recommendations. So you should be able to look at the label again, know the weight of your horse and know exactly how much of the product you should be administering on a daily basis. There should be identification of a lot and expiration date so that if your horse were to have um, an adverse reaction to the supplement, you're able to, you know, where we can help you notify the company that there's been an issue and clearly show them what lot number it comes from. Them posting that gives you a sense that they are tracking the lot numbers, tracking the production of their products, and would be able to respond appropriately if there was an adverse event. And um, additionally, there should be manufacturer information so that if you've asked us about the product and we need to find out more, we have quick, um, quick contact information so that we are able to do that. Um, there is a really great article with more detailed information um, here. Uh, it's on AAP.org and I'll put that in the chat at the end of the talk. So if you wanted to read the full acclaim file and some additional information specific to joint supplements, um, we'll provide that link to you. So that was oral supplementation. And I will say that oral supplementation doesn't have the best research behind it with regard to bioavailability, meaning you feed it to the horse and it actually makes it to their joints and um, produces therapeutic levels uh, in the joint itself. Um, but a product that does, and the only FDA approved um, product that does, is Adequan. And so this is not an Adequan commercial. They have not sponsored us tonight. Um, we are not getting any kickbacks for this. But I do feel very strongly that it's a product that um, can be given in the muscle uh, as a series of seven injections. Within two hours of giving it, there's levels... Um, of hyaluronic acid produced in the joints. It doubles the hyaluronic acid, which remember is that jelly-like coating that helps to create lubrication in the joints within two days. And then it actually makes it into the cartilage. Remember that cartilage degradation is what leads to that vicious cycle or snowball effect of increased um, inflammation. It makes it there within 96 hours. That kind of helps to give you that reasoning for why we do injections every four days because we want to keep the levels really high um, and reaching the cartilage for that entire month. Um, so the product is is reparative in nature. It can actually help to improve the, the cartilage. Um, I feel very strongly about it. I think it's, it's a non-invasive, um, minimally inexpensive if you compared it to the cost of like feeding an annual joint supplement. Um, the, the cost actually comes out to be pretty comparable, but the science behind it is certainly um, better. Uh, if we try the approaches that are more systemic and less invasive in nature, um, that could be the local anti-inflammatory support um, that we've talked about before. So icing, surpass ointment, um, Prev not Prevacox, Equiox, Banamine, or Butte. Um, we try all of those systemic approaches and we're still feeling like the horse needs um, additional help. We can pursue uh, more localized joint injections, um, but we'd like to pursue those after we've localized. We can localize with the flexion tests that Dr. Wright reviewed earlier in the talk. Um, with nerve blocks, and also with radiography to confirm that there's an indication for um, pursuing these joint injections. The process for um, completing the joint injection involves sterile preparation. Um, sometimes we've had clients ask, why don't we clip the site of injection? There's actually been some studies out there, a couple um, in 2010, 2012, that showed that when a horse was clipped prior to doing the joint injection, there was actually a higher um, incidence of little bits of hair or skin making it into the joint post-injection. So um, we specifically choose not to clip um, the horse for these injections. Um, after sterile prep, we perform the injection and then we typically wrap the joints unless it's uh, way high up on the leg and not in a place that we can bandage it. 
The horse is on stall rest for a minimum of three days. It can sometimes be up to a week or two weeks, depending upon which joints we're injecting. And then we uh, recommend a slow return to work. So that typically means under saddle walking for a couple days, trotting for a couple days, cantering, and then back to jumping over another week or so. Um, what we use in the joint injection will vary depending upon the joint that we are injecting and um, the cause or the reason for the injection. So um, we can use a steroid or a biologic. The biologic would be uh, like the Prostride or PRP that Dr. Matheny showed you pictures of previously. We can use hyaluronic acid. Um, which remember, Adequan helps the body produce its own hyaluronic acid. We're supplementing with additional with this high visc. Uh, and then we also use a little bit of an antimicrobial in our joint injections. Um, I do want to bring up the fact that there are some newer studies out there that um, are starting to question our use of antimicrobials in the joint because too much of an antibiotic within cartilage can actually create damage. So. We are still using antimicrobials um, at a very small dose, and um, doctors of Starwood are following the literature and following um, the experts to make the decisions about whether we're going to change our protocol. But um, at this point, we're not, but I thought it was worth bringing up that there, there is some talk of um, changing the standard of care, the standard protocol for antimicrobial use. Okay, so um, the next line of discussion is neuromuscular disorders. Um, in veterinary and human medicine, there is um, a short-term uh, abbreviation, TNTC. TNTC stands for too numerous to count. So as far as neuromuscular disorders go, they are too numerous to count, and um, we could do a whole um, presentation just on these disorders. So um, what I wanna say about them is we typically start and are called out because of performance issues or concerns of lameness, but sometimes those concerns, if we've gone through the entire lameness exam and ruled out the you know, musculoskeletal problems that we've already discussed with you, we might go down this path of um, considering a neurologic or a neuromuscular disorder as um, the cause of the lameness. So our lameness exam might shift to more of a neurologic exam. Um, this next video is actually from um, UC Davis, and it's specifically talking about um, neuroaxonal dystrophy in quarter horses. Ignore that big long word. Um, it's more of um, a video to sort of show you what neurologic horses can look like. And these are more severe um, examples. So this horse is weak in its hind end. When they ask it to place its feet across, you can see that it's sort of dragging its feet, doesn't quite know where they're located. Um, there's a little bit of a pause where this young horse should be able to just do a nice um, spin pretty quickly. Um, there's hill tests that we would do in the evaluation, I'm looking to see, can this horse walk up and down the hill? You notice this guy or gal um, has some trouble and drags those hind legs when she's working on the hill. And then there's a little bit of a difficulty with this curb, like finding where it is. You see she gets a little upset and um, jumps up onto the curb versus taking those nice smooth steps. So just to give you, again, some examples of what uh, potential neurologic issues look like that might be mistaken for a lameness type of issue. Um, the one neuromuscular disease that I am going to talk about is vitamin E deficiency because we do see that commonly and that is, um, I don't want to say trendy, but it's a little bit, it's, it's out there in the general public. So I think it's important to give you just a little bit more information to supplement um, the discussion from the nutrition talk we did. The clinical presentation uh, varies. It could be a very distinctly weak horse like we saw in those videos with underdeveloped muscul musculature like you see in these pictures here. This horse just has no hind end, no butt. Um, or it could be a horse that is competing at a really high level and the history that we get from you is, we don't know what it is, but they're just not quite right. They're maybe not jumping as great as they used to be, or they're not getting their lead changes quite as well as they used to be. Um, we will diagnose vitamin E deficiencies 
um, based on blood draw and response to therapy. Uh, and so this is actually that same horse after supplementation. So we have our kind of before and after photos there showing you the supplementation. Okay, why do I have this chart with all of these long terms on it? Um, I, if I take, if you take anything away from this discussion of vitamin E, what I want you to take away is that if you choose to supplement um, for vitamin E deficiency, first, we really want to get a blood test so that we know where we're starting from. Second, you need to use a naturally derived vitamin E source. And so um, it may or may not say natural on the label, but this uh, is a nice chart that you can refer to that helps you discern these synthetic um, compounds versus the natural compounds. So um, this chart will be available to you so that if you are supplementing for vitamin E right now, or if you're thinking about it, this is a way for you to cross check the products that you're using. All right, so Dr. Matheny did a great job of um, discussing the prevention of injury. And this is not just for um, neuromuscular disorders. This is not just for um, arthritic issues. This is for lameness issues in general. Um, there are studies that show that to get the full elasticity of the soft tissue structures, you need a solid 15 minutes of walking warm up. Set your Apple Watch, set a timer, figure out how many laps around the arena or around, you know, from the mounting block to the arena it takes for you to hit that 15 minute mark, but give your horse and yourself the benefit of that warm up time. Um, keep your horse on the regular trimming and chewing cycle, exercise to their fitness level, as we've said before. Um, this is a really interesting one. There was a study from UC Davis that looked at different footings. And what I learned or what we all learned from that study is there is no perfect footing. There are footings that are better for particular disciplines, but injury can be prevented by allowing your horse to cross train. So if you're at a facility that has, you know, one footing that's GDT and one that's sand, and then maybe has, you know, walking paths that are mulch, it's great to allow your horse to work in all of those different footings. It, it gets them a little bit more mobile in all of them. Uh, I would encourage everybody to consider systemic joint support like the Adequan that we discussed, and then um, offer your horse stretching and strengthening exercises. Uh, to do this, you can revisit our complimentary medicine talk, go to our YouTube channel where we will continue posting different stretches um, and strengthening exercises that you can do. Uh, and this is uh, uh, Frenchie showing us some of those exercises and Dr. Christie showing us some of those exercises that you can work through. Uh, so a couple key takeaways that we'd like you to take from this and then we'll open up to questions. Um, knowing what we're treating is the best and only way that we can monitor the patient's response to therapy. If we just start throwing you know, diagnostics or throwing treatments at your horse, then we won't really be able to gauge, are they not responding because we need to do something stronger or more invasive, or are they not responding because we're not um, treating the right issue? Um, sometimes a diagnostic therapeutic approach is needed or appropriate because we've exhausted our ability to do additional diagnostics on the farm, and now it's time to treat and see what response we get. There's a multitude of risk factors for laminitis, but keeping your horse healthy, um, a healthy weight metabolically stable can help in its prevention. Oral jo joint supplements are a dime a dozen as we saw um, in that picture and research on bioavailability is limited. So um, you really need to do your homework if you're going to consider using those oral joint supplements. Uh, my kind of takeaway would be save your money, put it towards Adequan. Naturally produced vitamin E is the only supplement that you should use if it's needed. Um, and then hoof abscesses are a very common cause of lameness, but they resolve more quickly with prompt treatment. If we can get that drainage going, we can get your horse comfortable quicker. And um, the final one is soft tissue injuries are preventable in some cases, but can be tricky to diagnose and certainly require patients through the process of working the horse up, but also um, through that rehab period. Yeah, I have a question. So let's say your horse um, suddenly is lame um, on the front leg. I think it's front right. Anyways, um, when when like when do you really need to have the vet come out versus just give it some time? 
So there doesn't appear to be an abscess or anything else, but, um, you know, like, should we just give it some time or is it important to have the vet? Like, how do you make, make that distinction when it's not, it's not something like really obvious? You would get a different answer from every doctor um, and your trainer. And, um, you know, the question is how lame is lame? Like Dr. Moting talked about, like, toe touching, like super uncomfortable coming out of the stall lame, or is it a little bit off on a circle to the right? Um, I'd love to hear what my colleagues say. <laughs> One thing I meant to actually put in the slides is there is nothing wrong with the tincture of time. Yeah. Like giving your horse time to rest and resolve from a lameness, you know, eight times out of 10 is going to, to really help. Um, I think where we can get into trouble is if something's occurred, we let them rest, we put them back to work, they're lame again. We let them rest, we put them back to work, they're lame again. I think that in those situations, we, um, we have the potential to get a little bit behind on our ability to like really address the primary cause of the lameness. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't think, especially if it's something subtle, I don't think that you're doing a disservice to your horse by giving it time. Annie message, uh, what do we, what are our thoughts on letting older horses with known arthritis in the front joints roll in the dirt and sand because they love it? Um, sometimes getting up is slower, sometimes not an issue. I say, let your horse be a horse. I think if that makes them happy and, you know, that's, that to me is just sort of like a quality of life. You know, we just can't bubble wrap them. Um, if getting down and stretching and rolling and maybe self-adjusting a little bit makes them feel good. Um, I don't see a problem with it. I think, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think especially in older horses with arthritis, they're, it, they definitely do better moving around. Like, you know, keeping them, you know, they're not going to do something that's going to make themselves worse. So definitely let them out walking, grazing, jumping, whatever, for sure. Yeah. And I would add, I think the, the worst thing is when they don't want to do those things anymore. That kind of lets you know they, like Cara said, they're not going to do something that's going to hurt themselves. They are somewhat decent at limiting and have some self-preservation. So um, all that's arguable though. But um, they, uh, if they quit laying down and they used to, that's a sign of, you know, this definitely hurts a little more, um, stuff like that. So if he's willing to do it, go for it. Let him be a horse. That's yeah, that's a really good point. We've had uh, we've had clients call us and say that they thought that their horse was you know narcoleptic, and while they had it out to ride or while they were tacking her up, she would just fall over. Um, and what we ended up looking into and finding out was she was not laying down in her stall. She never had shavings on her. The bedding was never rustled up or anything. And we started treating her for known arthritis um, using anti-inflammatories and I think some acupuncture support. And they started noticing that she had shavings on her body. Um, so that was sort of this like, shoot, she hasn't been laying down because she was probably nervous about getting up, but we made her comfortable enough that she could do that again. So um, yeah, and I think that that will be a nice gauge for you of knowing um, if you need to do more to help with comfort level. <laughs> with a saddle on? Well, let's not do it with a saddle on. <laughs> but <laughs> um, Maureen, you had a question yeah. before, and I... Um, I apologize because I didn't quite catch it in context. Your question was how old is old? Yeah, we oh, chatted yeah. about that. Um, so her question was how old is old? Um, not in the scheme of an injury, but like as far as like a horse. Um, so the answer, her horse specifically is 16, which I would say is right in the middle. Um, and then the question as far as what Dr. Matheny was talking about is older horses being 
um, potentially more prone to tendon injuries. Um, I would say old 20s and continuing onward, like senior horses or horses that are, you know, not doing lots of things. I have an, another related question, uh, not about oldness, but um, if, a, if a horse gets new shoes that can contribute to lameness potentially, like if the angle changes or something changes, but then will that just resolve on its own? You know, you just give it time kind of thing or, and how often does it happen with barriers, you know, with shoes? Well, so I think, it can happen and it's not for anything that the farrier did or didn't do. I will start by saying that. Um, I think that there can be times where um, horses, there are horses that are more sensitive. So like we have horses in our practice where we just know that they get sore every time they're shod. And so now the owner gives an anti-inflammatory around the time that they know that the farrier is coming. Um, so that can happen. I don't, I couldn't tell you a percentage, but I'd say that it's, 1% of the horses in our clinic we know um, get sore after a need to have medication around the shoeing mm -hmm. time. Um, I think other reasons that they could be sore post shoeing, you know, would be like a knotty nail or a close nail, as we like to say, where it does just get a little close to that delicate lamina that Dr. Wright talked about. Um, and again, our farriers don't have x-ray vision and we only do when we pull out, you know, the expensive equipment. So, um, I think it can happen, you know, by, by no fault of, of anybody, but people trying to do the best thing by the horses. Um, and, and most of the time it fully resolves, you know, with just a rest, letting the horse settle into the shoes and maybe some anti-inflammatories. If it continues or there's a very specifically sore spot, that might be a reason to, um, you know, ask the farrier if they're out regularly to check and maybe they put the hoof testers around the nails and one of the nails is a little close and they can remove it. Um, mm -hmm. And that can, that can kind of be the quickest fix. Um, but yeah, I think most of the time, would you all agree? Most of the time, it's just give it a little time for them to settle into their new shoes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. I think a lot of times if uh, it happens when we're trying to make a big correction um, at one time. So it's good when we're working with farriers, if we see something that needs to be corrected by several degrees or something like that, it's huge correction that we make those changes gradually to try and prevent that. Um, and then I guess if you do have a horse that is just sore with every shoeing cycle, maybe think about decreasing time in between so we're not getting those um big changes it was really great to see everybody tonight we um hope to see you on monday night for the ulcer talk and then the following wednesday night for our myth busters